And by then there was no plan per se of doing the Lord. I thought maybe just doing uh, lay preaching was sufficient for me until the Lord knocked me on the head and realized there was another way of going to do it. But I want to encourage you. Apparently this church is with the marriage. Can we safely say 50% of this church is with you? Or we can say 75%, 75, 75. Huh? You guys are not taking money. Right now I'm in charge of one check. Just one check. No branch, no company, just one check. So I don't go anywhere. I don't have to speak. I'm about Wednesday, Friday. This person is supposed to organize worship. If I'm not speaking, organize someone who's supposed to come and speak. So there is that kind of close proximity I have with the members. Now I'm learning one thing. I'm learning one thing. In most places, the youth or the youth department seems to be always antagonistic with the elders. I'm speaking from experience. I don't know the situation here, but this I can tell you first hand, first hand. It has normally been like that. And uh, some of the things I've heard people say is that, well, uh, as elders or as the top leadership of the church, they, they do not understand our trends. Yeah. They don't understand the kinds of And so, you will discover that they have very few advantages where you find the youths are on board and the elders are on the same board. Very, very few advantages. I can assure you. And I'm sure maybe that could be. Can I agree with you? Exactly. Now, a situation of such nature must not happen. And I'll tell you, in most cases, in most cases, not all cases, but in most cases, the problem is caused by the leaders. Failure to understand the needs of the youth and fear to understand and appreciate the times in which we are living in. Because one thing you're going to agree with me is that the way we do church in the 21st century, primarily in the year 2019, is not the way they did church in 1990. I've already said this. The gospel message, the Adventist message is the same, but the methods are different. Are we together? Exactly. I'll give you a very good example. When I went to FPC for two years, FPC means the Freedom Park Church, so we go FPC, all right? When I went there, I brought the idea of live streaming services every Sabbath, live streaming on Facebook. So right now, if you're on Facebook, you can just look up the name. You don't have uh, Every Sabbath, we live stream. We live stream. But when I brought the idea, guess what happened? The elders shot me. Maybe because I was a youth, youth pastor. All right? And they, and they did not see sense because to them, Facebook was ugly. Facebook is for, you know, for secular minded people. So I was now trying to tell them, hey guys, look. The whole world now is on Facebook. The youths are on Facebook. People are on Facebook. So if we are going to be effective in reaching people that do not come to church, let's open up an account on Facebook. There is nothing evil with Facebook. It's how people use it. So after you convince them, they so say, as I'm speaking to you right now, we are close to 7,000 likes and followers. People who watch our services. So I was not at FPC today, but I'm going to catch up. Let's go back to the and see what happened. That's a beautiful, innovative idea. Now you discover when these two groups of people are fighting, because maybe the senior people are failing to understand the younger generation. And maybe the younger generation, again, they have lost respect. Because that's another important thing. In as much as uh, we want the leadership of the church to appreciate our vision, appreciate our, our, our brilliant ideas, we must not lose respect in the process. But then how does God bless us? Even when we know we are right, but I still feel there must be ways that most students must come up with though, of addressing some of these ideas. We are not happy with how the pastor treated us. We are not happy with how leadership is treating us. But can there be a proper way we can dialogue? So we can issue out our our grievances. But in most cases, you discover the youth department is in one direction and the leaders are also pushing in the other direction. And so there is no harmony. Now, I am not putting the blame 
primary on the on the elders. Are we together so far? Yes. Yes. Hello? So I am not putting the blame on one group. I'm saying in most cases you discover both groups have got issues. But if you are gonna be on a safe side, do what is right. Because there is this thing called insubordination. You want to know what it means? Insubordination. Lack of respect towards leaders. And I don't think God can bless you if you've got no respect towards leaders. I don't think so. I went to a place uh, on the core of Beowood, I think that would have been Shingola. So I went to this church and um, I did a Bible study in the afternoon. And I want to think about. Uh, uh, when you want to know people's characters, like you want to know those who are very vocal in the church, do a study. That's when they have uh, an opportunity to vent out their frustrations. And some of these people don't even care whether it's a visitor has come. They'll just vent out because they found a platform to vent out. So from there, as a preacher, I'm able to know, okay, there are issues here. Why are they taking advantage of my coming here? Implying that maybe they feel that when they speak through the new guy, other people will also get their grievance. So I discovered one thing, there was this guy who was very vocal, almost at every point he wanted to interject. Then I realized mm -mm, there, was, there must be a problem here. And apparently I discovered he was a youth leader right there. So what happened, because I descended by the grace of God, I called the guy after, after, after I started. I said, bro, why were you coming out like that? I'm pastor here. The youth movement is completely dying. Elders want to have their way. They don't appreciate us. We are a younger generation. So after that encounter I had with him, I had to call the other elders. So we went to the vestry and we began to dialogue. I said, no, no, things should not be like that. Now elders were now, were now telling me, no, the problem with him, as you saw him, no respect. No respect at all. They would just stand up, yes. And one thing is for sure, even as pastors, I'm a pastor. But I'll tell you one thing, being a pastor does not make me infallible. I make mistakes. And there's some... There are some things I do in my church, I'll even regret after something. I think that method did not work. Maybe I was too harsh with the people. But what is important is to have a sense of realization and say, okay, guys, I'm sorry. I am not proud to seek for forgiveness, even as a pastor when I'm wrong. I'm not proud of it. To find, I think I'm sorry and whatnot. So from that conversation with, the, with Brian and the other elders, his name is Brian, we are able to come up with some consensus. Okay, fine. Elders, I think you're also failing to understand the trends church is changing. The way my dear elder is youthful days are not your youthful days. So now the problem comes in if he is expecting you to run your youthfulness the way he did, then there's going to be a crash. Am I right? Yes, sir. Exactly. Because the world is getting more sophisticated now. Exactly. Uh, back in their days, they had no social media. Mm. They had no uh, distractions. But today, with it's social terrible. media, the world has become a global village. So with these sophistications comes with other complex issues that maybe our forefathers were not facing. So what I would wish to encourage all of us is that as much as we may not always come up with a consensus, maybe with the leaders or maybe even with your pastor, Pastor George, I don't know, I've not been here before. But if we don't come up with a consensus, let us look for ways of having a proper dialogue. Because lack of respect to leadership would also attract certain repercussions that will not be palatable for your life. You may be right, quite right, but maybe the way you want to address your grievance. And I've discovered what normally brews a lot of confrontation in most churches is when you have maybe a docker society fighting against the first elder, and because maybe the first elder used abusive language when he was addressing the ladies, and instead of trying to dialogue and pray about it, they begin to fight back psychologically. Just psychological. They will never come out in the open, but you can tell this behavior is unruly. Now, as a church, we don't resolve conflicts like that. We dialogue. We dialogue. So, in a nutshell, there is need for us as pastors, there is need for us as elders to understand that the needs of the young people are changing every day. They are changing every day. I think you heard me talk about uh, uh, the, you know, uh, this issue of uh, silence in church and whatnot. A bit to Adventist church here in Zambia, no matter how the preacher speaks, they are all quiet, not even an amen. All quiet, all quiet, as if we have all gathered for some funeral procession. <laughs> but we are in the house of God. And some of us have interpreted frowning, eh, like frowning for holiness. 
Things don't work like that. Now, our old folks may not appreciate that maybe. Maybe because of how they, they also worshipped in those days. You can't blame them. You know, issues to do with worship have got issues to do with culture as well. So with us, we, we interpret uh, silence as reverence. Yes, it can mean reverence, but not all the time. Things like amen, hallelujah, that's okay. But again, there are also other extremes which you must guard against, which you, so that you don't go overboard as well. So it then become as if it's a praise team. Eh? These people are speaking, they are also speaking like consistently. Others, remember, others may be weaker in faith. What may be okay for you may not be okay for your friend. A Christian must be sensitive enough to accommodate the weaker brethren so that you don't become a stumbling block for that individual that may not uh, you know, appreciate what you're doing in the house of God. So sometimes you come up you know, with some level of compromise. But trust me, with the experience we've had this week, I'm sure some minds have been opened by the grace of God and you begin to approach worship from a certain perspective. Because even the elders and the, the veterans in the church are able to see that truly uh, there would be nothing wrong in uh, you know, having an audience that would respond you know, once in a while, amen, hallelujah, and it ends there. So uh, we need to appreciate each other, respect each other. Do not fight back. If you feel a, a, a certain leader is stepping on your toes, please do not revenge, do not retaliate psychologically. Talk about it. I have always said this. You've got a grievance with him. Talk about it. You don't like my hairstyle. Talk about it. Don't fix me in the same one. Talk to me. Talk to me. You understand? Yeah, talk to me. Talk to me. Because you know what? When you talk to someone at, uh, at a personal level, you may be more effective than when you decide to take it to the pulpit. Yeah. You, you, you'll be more effective. Yes, like I said on, uh, on Wednesday, uh, the platform in some places, it has become a place where you settle scores. Eh? You don't like the youths, just prepare a sermon. And why are they in the sermon? Because in that way, you're the one who's speaking. They, you won't give them a chance to speak back. So now you're on the stage, you're the one calling the shots, and you can hammer and bash them. No, no, no. Church must not be like that. You've got issue with an elder, you've got an issue with a sister. Make sure you dialogue. I believe, personally, I believe in dialogue. Strongly believe in dialogue. Stop giving this... Uh, um, I once said someone put it in a funny way. They say, picture, no sound. You know what picture, no sound means, right? Yeah, just showing this non-verbal skill, cues, non-verbal action. You know, yeah, say, so yeah, you know, that kind of stuff. No, 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 you talk about stuff, you talk about stuff. And one thing I'll tell you is that leadership always has weakness. Did you know that? Leadership always has weakness. I can imagine even here, these leaders have got weaknesses. Even me as a pastor, where I'm coming from, I've got weaknesses. But if you are going to address my weaknesses so as to expose me and make me appear as if I'm dumb and you are more clever and you do it in public, I may lay your hands on you. Yeah, I may lay your hands in the name of Jesus. So there must be a way in which we address uh, some of these issues. Maybe I may entertain some questions and uh, in the discussion. How can we look at this one? Okay. Uh, say something? Uh, um, I talk loud, just like, just like I am. Like I'm very loud. Okay. Uh, but then uh, maybe some people might find disrespect, but that's just the way I am. So how do I handle that when I'm talking to other people? And this uh, body. <laughs> that's just the way I am. Yeah, <laughs> people just say no. This boy does not agree with me, but that's just the way I talk. Okay. I'm just loud. Like, it's just the uh, praise just loud. Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, I appreciate. Now if you notice I said something about the weaker brethren that we're not all at the same level in church, right? There are people who are more mature in faith. There are people who can absorb mm -hmm. gossip. They will still go to church. Others when you gossip them, you never see them at church. You lose them forever. So if you feel maybe uh, your disposition may affect one or two people. Maybe it would not be wrong to begin to readjust for the sake of some level of peace and understanding. It would not be wrong. Because why I'm saying so, if you say, this is the way I am, and everyone has to dance to my tune, they need to accept me and understand me this way. Guess what? Not everyone may be able to understand you. And you know, sometimes happens in the church, people speak a lot of people.
stuff in the church. You know that, right? And in fact, if there is a church that knows how to, to you know, uh, wire you, if there's a church with members that know how to pulverize you and break you down in pieces, it's this church. People can talk in this church. Did you know that? People will backbite even someone lying in a coffin in this church. One is dead. They're backbiting as the body is moving, the procession. This church. This church. And sometimes some of these things we hear can affect us psychologically. Psychologically. And if you are not rooted in faith, you leave. So maybe in a nutshell, bro, uh, it, it's good to be outspoken. Personally, I, I, I appreciate people outspoken because they don't keep things to themselves. Yeah, they just let it out. And, and sometimes in the process of letting it out, they step on people's toes. And again, that becomes the challenge. So I think, I think it's one thing of uh, understanding and realizing, okay, what is it about me that is offensive to others? If the way I come out is interpreted as a lack of respect, maybe I need to slow down. There's nothing wrong with that as well. There's nothing wrong with that. I'll give a very practical example of myself. Like I always tell you, I'm not, I'm not your standard, I'm not your model, Christ is your model. When I was a preacher some years ago, I was very serious. Very serious. I hardly, I hardly smiled in public. <laughs> hardly smiled. Not, not because I was upset, but I, I realized it's, it's who I was. Bro, I was just like that. I found it so difficult just to lighten up the muscles of the face and just smile. Especially when I'm in public. You find me joke with friends and stuff like that, tapping on each other's backs, but when I'm in public, like, I'm going to the pulpit and, you know, of course, I know sometimes we are serious when we preach and stuff like that, but even outside the pulpit, I would always realize. People would find it so difficult to approach that colored guy. I'm talking about myself. Very, very difficult. But Elder, when I heard what people were saying, okay, fine, we appreciate the pastor's ministry, but... He appears as if he's not approachable. This is what I was getting. When I first heard this, I would just brush them. I would say, no, no, no. Those who are misjudging me, they are not close to me. They don't know me. But then I realized, no, no, I'm a public figure. People can judge me from a distance. So then, about two years ago, I, I, I decided to start changing for the sake of the weaker brethren. I said, okay, as you can see now, I smile a lot. And uh, I can hug you, I can get a selfie with you. Back in the day, I wouldn't do that. Not because I hate you, but because that was my personality. It, it was who I was. So it was very, very difficult to change. And sometimes our personalities may not even be sinful personalities, but they may be offensive. Sinful and offensive is different. Are we together? They may be offensive. People may misunderstood you. People misunderstood me and they judged me from a distance. Only those who were close to Ernesto were able to say, well... He's a good guy. When you get close to him, he's a very jovial guy. You talk, you go together for, you know, uh, go and watch a, a movie at the cinema. He's like that. And people will say, no, 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 that one is too serious. That preacher is too serious. Does he even have a private life? You know, such kind of stuff. And I realized, no, no, I think I have to change my approach. Let me smile often. Even when I don't really mean it, let me just try to smile often because of what I do. So I began to change so that I can just begin to accommodate other people. Otherwise, at first I was very defensive and it used to affect me so much whenever people would say that because I knew I was friendly, except they wanted me, people wanted me to show it. Okay. Any other question? Okay, I'll, I'll come to you. Uh, him. Uh, now, come, come. This man is not our member. Okay? He's from the Reformed Baptist Church. Amen. And he's studying to be a pastor in that movement. So he just approached me there. I was very, very happy. Bro, you are welcome. God loves you. It doesn't matter. God loves you and we are happy to have you here. Say something, please.
and the elders are complaining, the youth also are complaining. And you cannot really understand who is going to win the game. You might think maybe the elders are wrong, while the youth are wrong. You might think the youth are wrong, while the elders are wrong. Mm. Now, as a leader, or maybe every member of the church, what do you mean? I think that's the, the that's the million dollar question. How do we harmonize this vision? Because you've got two people in two groups of people from, from two wide different generations. And they've got two different needs. So how do we really I see right? how do we really really harmonize? And I think one of them is simply open dialogue. That's why we have a mission. Here now we can speak. This is, a, this is an elder in charge of you, am I right? How we wish there were other elders here as well. So they can be here. Yeah, they have my, my elders. But the Pasika Modri. Fantastic. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They have okay, okay. So I think, it, I think it's like that. Open dialogue. We are having such kind of... Uh... Okay, just give me 10 minutes. I think it's uh, having such kind of open forum, all right? Because right now we are just youth. So if there was a group of elders here or other leaders, we know it's just us. But can you imagine keeping your grievance and decide to unleash it during Bible study? Now in Bible study, it's a mixed multitude. There are people who are not in the stage, people who are busy for the first time. What impression do they carry with about it? Become the challenge. So I think one of the ways we can try to bridge the gap is to, to have such kind of open forum where we can open the dialogue, where he stands up and says, But you see, me, this is how I am. To people think I am, uh, you know, uh, 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 disrespectful. It's who I am. He's just expressed. And I, I applaud him for his, uh, you know, sincerity because in such manner he can talk about uh, this thing is uh, open. The second point, I was still coming to that one, is understanding that the needs of these two generations are different, bro. completely different. That's why in some churches you have a youth pastor. You know why there's a youth pastor? Because he's a youth, he's able to relate well with them. There are other folks who are older who may not relate properly with them and understand them at that level. So now you've got a youth pastor who's specifically you know, in the church to look at the needs of the youth. And the youth pastor now channels those needs in a mature way to the higher organization. And there's some kind of... Otherwise, this challenge, and I'm glad, he's a reformed Baptist. Can you imagine? So he has the same challenge as he's going through. Youths and elders, they are always clashing. But we still need to ask for more wisdom from above and uh, come up with tangible solutions on how to, you know, uh, 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 bridge this gap. Unfortunately, in some churches, the gap is even widening by the day. Proper widening. There's no proper, you know, uh, 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 rapport between the people you know, uh, groups of people. You know. So solutions could be many. I may mean, not even know some of them, but this is where we have the change. And this is where we pray and fast to get some of these solutions. Otherwise, it's a problem we cannot ignore. And I'm sure we also have it here. Am I right? It's almost everywhere. Adventist, not Adventist, it's almost everywhere. But I think we need to talk about it. People must come out in the, in the open and, uh, you know, in the air of the There are things which is evil and which we must do. We need to avoid. I'll give you an example. If I've got a problem with this one, look at me, look at me. I have a problem with my good elder here. And I put him aside according to Matthew chapter. Matthew chapter what? Matthew chapter what? 
But he says it's your brother, whatever it is. Hey, hey, you people don't know the Bible. Make chapter what? Make chapter? Do you know what I'm talking about? Exactly. Okay, you. Chapter 6. No, 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 that's not chapter 6. <laughs> okay. So I'm saying, according to that biblical injunction, I pull him aside and say, Mudala, I am not happy the way you talk to me. That day you stepped on my toes and maybe the tone of your language was very unpalatable. I'm not happy. Ah, oh, bro, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. Things are over. It must die there. Hello? If it resurrects, you are foolish. Did you hear what I'm saying? Say it again. If it resurrects somewhere and say, actually, I, I met the elder and we talked here. And you know, can you imagine even... Even push me aside and say ABCD. That man. Meanwhile, when you concluded the discussion, you are all happy and it was over. Once you decide to resurrect it and take it to your friend and say, look at what happened, then you're not a Christian. Actually, you are a conduit of the devils and demonic power in church. Because you be yes, 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 yes. You become a channel of division in the church. If I've discussed with him and he's forgiven me, it must end there, I must never hear it anywhere. And I've discovered these are some of the things affecting our church, eh? where two people had a private discussion. Maybe one was not completely happy. Instead of speaking to the friend, they pretended as if they were okay. Waiting for it to resurrect in some other platform and it begins to brew like wildfire. That's wrong. That's absolutely wrong. What you discuss in private over grievances, if you have concluded let it die. Unless there was no conclusion. Maybe you can bring in some people here. But if there was a conclusion, and you pretended that you were okay, when you are not okay, you are the devil's cousin. Say it again. <laughs> the devil's cousin because you, you mean no good to the church. Yes, sir. Your hand there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm. Uh, the the <laughs> in, the, in the element of studying the gospel between the elders and our youths. Okay. You find to say that maybe the elders don't know much, mm. the youths know much. Mm -hmm. So you find to say when the youth stands up to say, I think the elder there you are wrong. Uh, it will be a fight between now the elders and the youths. Because of being corrected, the elders don't want to be corrected. So you find to say that if you even ask the youth, an elder will come out to us to tell us to say, I think we don't like this. Because it is the truth, it will be a fight. I, I like the way the, in Choma, what happened that day in the sixth house. Okay. Uh, there was a fight at church. Okay. The elders taught the youth to say, everyone who went to the council is going to say Shai. Mm. The youth, the pastor had to come in, the youth director had to come in to say, no, 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 these are doing under the constitutional uh, matters, or under the policies of the church, because it's, this is what I'm saying. What came out there was a lot than mm. the meeting. Okay. So you're going to say that sometimes, let's bring our elders to learn with us. They'll learn more. Then you interject them maybe to a business meeting, we tell them point of order. Then they tell you, what is that point of order? <laughs> okay, so okay. you're trying to say, I think one of the challenges, I think my, my elder can, can agree with me. There was a group, pastor, which was, pastor, this is your order. <laughs> but, yeah. You find, I think the elder can agree with me. You find that the elder is what used to come on. Sometimes you're even surprised to say, they were said to say, master guides are 10, one master guide is equal to, Ten more elders. Because they don't say <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 Oh my, oh my, oh my. <laughs> I think also, Pastor, uh, as we do, yes, sir. we need to call the elders. Let them go. You call the elders to say, oh, elders, uh, there's this platform. Uh -huh. It will be now a conflict. No, you can't teach us. As we know, everything already. Mm. I've seen that mm. happening. Mm. Mm. I've gone mm. to teach a uh, church. Then some elders started now reacting to say, no, you can't teach this, you can't teach this. Mm. They removed them on the, until the elders, the, the admin elders said, no, 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 no. We want to learn chairmanship so that when they come to meeting, we don't find problems with them. Yeah. That's when the elders sat down and started learning. But mm. even in the process of learning, uh, they challenge mm. Because you bring a topic to them, you know to say, no, this, I think it's, this group is saying something else, this group is saying there's something else. I think one of the challenges, Pastor, like you've come, Let's, let's talk to our elders. Let's them come to our meeting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
It all borders down to your definition of humility. Like me, I'm a pastor. Trust me, I make mistakes. And I've been corrected before. But what I do not appreciate is the spirit in which you are correcting me. If the spirit and the tone in which you are correcting me is clearly sarcastic, ah, I don't think it's going to be okay. Yes, I acknowledge, bro. I need to learn. And by the way, the issue to do with chairmanship, most elders don't know those things. The chairmanship, really. As well as elders, maybe who have never gone through uh, a youth movement. You can't chair a meeting, and sometimes there's, there's a youth that understands what point of order means, the motion has been lost, the motion has been carried. All of those, uh, you know, bureaucratic terms, and there's an elder who's uh, ignorant of that. It's a challenge, and it's, it's quite embarrassing. Yeah, it's quite embarrassing. But again, we should not assume that as youths, we are the ultimate uh, source of knowledge. There are still stuff that we can learn from the elders, too. Yeah, after a lot of things, but I also feel the elders must also learn something from uh, from the youths. I think uh, I gave a good example. My first crusade, I was only 18. No elder wanted me to preach at that church. No elder. It was the youths that saw what God had put in me. And guess what? After baptizing over 125, my first ever crusade, everyone was now interested on who is this 18 year old boy. <laughs> you see some of these nuances, right? Exactly. So, but I think you are you are absolutely right, my brother. You are very, very right. Uh, I feel as elders, we need to be humble enough. Yeah, we need to be humble enough to acknowledge our deeds and uh, you know uh, be willing to make amends. But again, like I said, it's the spirit of correction. If the spirit of correction is uh, brought about in humility, no elder think there you are wrong. Ah, are you telling me I'm wrong? No, I'm saying there I think you have uh, you have missed the point. You know? look for nice palatable ways. Don't just say you are, you, you, you are misleading us as a church. <laughs> yes, it's true they are misleading, but, but the way you come out, because remember, these are people who have gone before you. These are elderly people they have gone before you. They may be wrong, but they've gone before you. So they deserve some level of respect. They've gone before us. Yes, my dear. Okay. Sure, you know when I was in a debate, uh, one of the Adventure leaders, and we had to organize a, an Adventure program for the kids. Now what happened is that, so this is all, you can't be in a group, you have to pass it through the court. Mm -hmm. But now it was too late for us to pass that name to the court. So what happened was, my colleague, he just decided to bring him that particular group here. So what happened was, he was the only one that was able to do that. So what happened was, I brought them here. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I was caught in the basement. Mm -hmm. One of the elders. I got to see these plates. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Huh. And what I went through in that basement is something that I do now to him. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Because I found, I found out that most of the elders that we have like we did last time. Because of yeah. our age. Because I was gunned down at that time. <laughs> <laughs> and the problem is that when the time I was gunned down, I was going in front to pray. So I went there with a bitter heart. Because I was shouting that seriously. Mm. So I'm thinking, as a pastor, just try to talk to the elders on how to approach such an issue. Let them not okay. intimidate us because of our age. I know some of us look young, but we are above age, some of us. But let I want you to talk to them so they should intimidate us. There's too much education in the church. So I think it goes in both ways. As much as the elders expect respect from us, they must also treat us with kindness, right? Exactly. Yeah, you're right. Because I can only imagine the kind of pain you endured in that place. <laughs> Yeah, but again, you know, these issues again border on uh, uh, procedure. Procedure is still important. There are people who believe in uh, Matthew chapter 28, go in there for. And, uh, and in fact, they will even tell you, in go in there for, there's no uh, letter of invitation, 
there is no procedure. So why are we having these things? Well, those things are important because they prevent uh, unnecessary offshootism from taking place. Can you imagine if it was just go in there for anyone can just come here? You, you end up having a bunch of Davidians misleading the church into extremism and fanatism. So some of those things, yes, sometimes they are too much, but we also need them just to have some kind of regulation and a certain way things must flow. So, but bro, I feel your pain. You are right. Elders, uh, we need to... <laughs> know how to handle our youths. And remember, our youths have got a tender heart. Uh, they, they may not be as strong as we are, because as we've seen many days, we've seen church drama and church politics, and some of them may still be trying to hang in there. So you are right, bro. I think it goes in, in both ways. And they are here. They are, they are, they are listening. They are listening. <laughs> okay, now we need to wrap this thing up. My elders are already... Elder, how are you? Good to see you. <laughs> Definitely. I'm a youth actor. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, so my question is, uh, it's a it's a very personal question, and I don't know if anybody has gone through this before, uh, but how do you deal with self guilt? Like those those types of situations where. You know, you sin, and then you want to, you know, repent. And then you repent quite the right. You even become a very strong Christian, but then again, something else happens. And then, how, okay, how do you keep on rising? Because, you know, you have that guilt to yourself saying that, okay, you know, this isn't, okay, they, they didn't feel right. You know, just always going back, doing the same things and stuff like that. So, yeah, how do you do it? It's okay. So that question is a bit off what we're discussing, but I'll still, I'll still answer it in my conclusion, my concluding uh, remarks. You're right. I'll